Hello, happy International Day of Women and Girls in Science. My name is Ranger Tara Lynn, and I'm standing in front of the four-legged mammal fossil skeleton displays inside the visitor center at Agate Fossil Beds National Monument. Many people don't realize that paleontology is more than excavating cool things in the field. There's a lot of research that goes on outside of the digs. You know, there's no one better to help us understand that than our four female paleontologists today. They're here to share the newest information they found on ancient camels, rhinoceroses, and deer. Now, while the videos are recorded today, each of these amazing ladies are live in the chat today. So go ahead and type your questions or comments at any time during this presentation. So let's get started with our first paleontologist, Daniela Balasha. She's focused on an ancient camel species named Oxydactylus. Go ahead, Daniela. Background picture of backhoes digging large holes next to a wooden fence within a valley surrounded by mountains. Text reads, Daniela Balasha, graduate student in geology, California State University of Long Beach. Daniela speaks from a box in the corner of the PowerPoint. She is a woman with light skin complexion and long dark brown hair. Hi there. My name is Daniela Balasha. I'm a graduate student at Cal State Long Beach in Southern California. Three vertical pictures fill a screen. First, Daniela wears a face mask and points to a projector screen on a wall indoors. Second, Daniela wears a hard hat with word SOMAS on the front near a mound of dirt and construction trucks. Third, she holds a fossil jaw indoors in front of several shelves of fossils. Text, grad student, instructor, paleontological resources specialist, researcher. Just a brief background about myself. Growing up, I always knew I wanted to become a scientist. I just wasn't quite sure what kind of scientist till I got into community college. And it was in community college when I really discovered my passion for geology and paleontology. And so I decided to pursue it. And so fast forward many years later, I am now a grad student doing my master's thesis at Cal State Long Beach, as previously mentioned. Here I also instruct. So uh, you can see here on me on the left hand image. And I also dabble in research along with many, many, many female co-authors uh, where we've done several publications in the past with my advisor, Donald Prothrow. So here I am on the right-hand side, dabbling in the collections of UC Berkeley. And I believe I'm holding a bear uh, sample. And at the same time, I am also working for a company called Somas, where I monitor construction. So I am a paleontological resources specialist where I try and look for fossils. Two pictures fill screen with text, rewarding profession. Left, two long bone fragments rest on a surface next to a ruler labeled GSA. Right, a cylindrical bone covered in dirt rests on clumps of dirt next to another GSA ruler. And so my profession can be very rewarding. For example, just last month, we've found these specimen that you see here on the image belonging to some unknown mammal. And because California has a strict CEQA guideline protecting its resources, it's very important for me to watch any excavation or construction in Southern California to make sure we don't come across samples and destroy them. So I have to immediately bag it, tag it, and keep it safe until the end of the project. Stock image of fingers pointing at a female who is looking down and covering her ears. Title, Pressures of Harassment, My Experiences in College. Then, two pictures next to a list that Daniela reads. First, three adults and Daniela wear safety vests and sit together at a table outside near a body of water. Second, two women and Daniela stand with a man in a suit and tie indoors. Now, my struggles as a female scientist have not always been easy. Um, for example, going into my master's program, I've experienced harassment. And I'm pretty sure many people can say that we've all dated the wrong person. Well, this individual, when I met, uh, I knew immediately we were not right for each other. I saw the red flags. And when I wanted to break things off, well, he would not take no for an answer. So things escalated very quickly into stalking, a uh, series of text messages and phone calls um, nonstop and also hacking. And I think it's important to raise awareness, especially for people who work in a very 
male dominated industry such as geology and construction um, for females but not just females any demographic it's important for them to protect themselves and know their rights and laws so the things i've learned is to speak up do not be scared to ask for help people will always be there for you know your rights and laws so that not only in college like for me you're protected, but in any areas of life, you're always protected. And so therapy also does not make you look weak. Uh, it in fact makes you stronger. And you'd be surprised many people do therapy on a daily basis. So luckily I had a very great supporting system. My advisor was the one who filed for the harassment, who you see here on the bottom image, along with my female co-authors who were also very supporting in my difficult um, time. And just continue to work hard. Do not let get anything in the way of your goals and achievement. That was also very important for me to uh, emphasize. So in my job, I'm very fortunate to have extremely respectful and professional people. So the image you see above are my current coworkers at Laguna Project. And, and this is just, you know, like a very small size of the crew. Everyone is extremely wonderful, um, but do surround yourself with amazing people. Slide title, What is a Giraffe-Like Camel? A Taxonomic Revision of the Miocene Camel Oxydactylus, presented by Daniela Balasha, co-author Donald Prothero. Text sits in front of a simple camel sketch. Then, text title, background, with a list of three items Daniela reads. Geologic time scale, from Eocene to Pleistocene, lists vertically. A single line follows this scale with the names of various camels listed as leaves off the main line. Oxydactylus is the third from the top in the Miocene section. So one of those goals that I never wanted to give up was getting my master's degree. And so my project that I am actually working on is a giraffe-like camel named Oxydactylus. And so this is a taxonomic revision of this Miocene camel that my advisor and I are currently working on. And just to give you a little brief, brief background, uh, most people think of camels as two humps. But this is actually a misconception because it's a specialization you see in Asian and African camels today. Uh, however, we like to think and we assume that most camels did not have humps. So origination, origination of camels began around the Middle Eocene, which was 40 million years ago. And they quickly dispersed uh, to Eurasia during the late Miocene and then to South America during the Pliocene. So in South America, we are very familiar with them today as llamas, alpacas, guanacos, and vaquinhas. But the little critter that I'll be focusing on is Oxydactylus, as I mentioned, and here I highlighted in red for you of when they began to originate. Daniela holds a skull next to closed lockers indoors. Caption reads, Oxydactylus campestris. Title, what is Oxydactylus? With a list of five items Daniela reads. Then, a camel stares at us from the back of a pickup truck on a road through a sandy desert. Three question marks appear above the camel's head. Titles, the problem and importance read by Daniela. So, as I mentioned, Oxy Oxydactylus is the critter I'm working on, and it began appearing right around early Miocene. So, Peterson... Uh, was the one to first describe this creature in 1904, which is a while back. And they collected a lot of their samples from the running water, Upper Harrison, Anderson Ranch Formation, equivalent to Agate Formation of Western Nebraska, South Dakota, and Eastern Wyoming. So Oxydactylus is very recognized by its slender appearance, long snout, long legs, long necks, hence the giraffe-like name. And so prior to this study, there were eight named species referred to as Oxydactylus, which is a taxonomic wastebasket. And so let's dive into why that is. So camel evolution, camel systematics is actually terribly outdated. As you see, Peterson described Oxydactylus in 1904. And during this time, paleontology was still very dubious. 
So, for example, just to give you um, an idea, when early paleontologists discovered a sample, they did not account for sexual dimorphism, such as differences between males and females, juveniles, or even if the sample was crushed uh, due to uh, terribly terrible fossilization process. So everything was named a new species as they found them. And systematics is, is so crucial and fundamental for any analysis of diversity change, extinction, or origination rates. A four-legged animal skeleton with a long neck and small narrow head is propped up by vertical bars inside. Label reads Octodactylus holotype from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History, Pittsburgh. Title, Brief Overview and Goals of the Project. Daniela reads her first and second phases of the project. And so my project is to redetermine if species names are still valid within Oxydactylus. And I do this by using modern statistics, which is the first phase of my project. The second phase of my project I will not be discussing today for the sake of time. And I just will quickly briefly mention that I also uh, looked at recent wild vicinias and guanacos and compared them to Oxydactylus. Slide title, Methods. List of museum collections on chart are Frick Collection of Department Paleontology and the Department Mammalogy at American Museum of Natural History in New York, the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, Museum of Paleontology at University of California, Berkeley, South Dakota School of Mines, the Nesky Museum of Natural History at Amherst College, Carnegie Museum of Natural History in Pittsburgh, Smithsonian Institution at the National Museum of Natural History. Then, slide title, Measure Components with Digital Caliper. A small metal tool with an attached ruler and a digital screen is pictured next to a skull drawn from three different perspectives. So I visited many museum collections, like, for example, the very famous one in the American Museum of Natural History in New York, the Frick Collection, where an entire floor is just dedicated to North American camels. And so I measured many components of fossils and recent camels with a digital caliper. I measured height, width, length of skull, diastema, molars, premolars, canines, and so on. Daniela reads the information listed on the slide titled Coefficient of Variation. Then, slide title results for Phase 1 Oxydactylus. Two pictures labeled A and B of the upper cranium of an animal with a wide distance between ears and a narrow snout. Two pictures labeled C and D of the lower jaw of the same animal. Corresponding graphs display the mean standard deviation and coefficient of the variation. And once I gathered all my data, I put the raw data into Excel and then calculated for the mean standard deviation and coefficient of variation, which is the coefficient variation is just a common method for detecting multiple species within a population. So if my results yield less than 10, then it suggests that it's a single species. However, if it's greater than 10, then it might mean I have more than one species. So here's some of the samples of my results that I got for Oxydactylus. So both the upper cranium and lower jaw show that I have coefficient of variation greater and less than 10. So what is happening here? What could be the reason? Scatter plot graph titled skulls. Five shapes indicate five different camel species. The oxydactylus shape appears the most within the larger cluster on the graph. Then, second scatter plot graph of skull length on the bottom versus canine size along the side. Oxydactylus shape again dominates and spreads in vertical lines across the whole graph. So we decided to plot this in bivariate plot where we looked at uh, premolars 2 to 4 versus molars 1 to 3. And when we plotted them, we got a big cluster, jumble cluster, which you cannot separate into groups. So this is a cloud of continuous variation, and there are no grounds for objectively separating them by size, unfortunately. We also looked at some other results. We looked at the skull length versus canine size, which typically tell you sexual dimorphism, whether if they're male or female. And again, it's the same thing. There is no correlation. You can't 
separate them into groupings. Everything is just a big cluster. Slide titled, Why the High CV? List of animals grouped together on a family tree that starts from the same point. The even toe ungulates on the tree are hippos, whales, ruminants, pigs, and camels. The odd tail ungulates of rhinos and horses are on the bottom. Daniela reads list titled, High CV among Archidactylus and causes. So now why the high CV? What is going on? Lucky for us, there's a recent research done by Davis in 2018 where they looked at artiodactyls with unusually high coefficient of variation. And it turns out they're just extremely variable. And as I previously mentioned, I have done a second phase of my project. Well, I looked at recent wild chemolids, did some measurements and calculations, and it turns out it coincides with Davis's findings. It is that camels are just highly variable. So what is the cause of this? Well, it could be sexual dimorphism, or it could also be the crushing of skulls where they just did not fossilize well, but we can outrule this because we have looked at the recent camelids, which are perfectly preserved, and you could see that they're just extremely variable when comparing them to oxidactylus. But the variation can also be due to age-related wear on the teeth, perhaps. So, slide title, conclusion. Daniela stands near the head of an animal skeleton on display indoors. Her eyes focus on the head as she holds a measuring tape near its teeth. Caption reads, Oxidactylus long apes. She reads from a list on the screen. Then, slide title, thank you. Stock image of a head chop of two llamas with lots of long fur with colorful pink and purple pom-poms and hearts on the harnesses over their long snouts. As conclusion, just to restate everything I, I said, everything is one continuous cluster. And so there is no evidence that size range is due to sexual dimorphism since canine size does not correlate with skull size. So then what happens? Well, we find that the only valid species of genus are then the six junior synonyms, which are Oxidactylus benedentatus, Campestris, Lakota, Exilis, Lali, and Wyoming ensis. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Daniela. We look forward to hearing which of the camels get to stay in the race. It's time for our first break. This is a great time to process that information and think of more questions for Daniela. When we return to the top of the hour, our next paleontologist, Kristen, will tell us about her research on a different camel species. See you then. <laughs> 